back to the channel. It's Lit Life with Miranda Reads, and today we're gonna do a little series review. Now, if you are anywhere active on the Goodreads community, you may have heard of this little known series called A Court of Thorns and Roses, aka Akotar by the fans. Now this series has garnered over 1.5 million ratings on Goodreads. But what is this series about and is it worth all this hype? I'm glad you asked and I'm here to answer. The Akotar series currently has five books. Three in the main trilogy, one collection of short stories, and the start of a new spin-off series set in the same world. Akotar is the first in the series and I'm gonna pop it on screen. Now anecdotally, I have noticed that a lot of people love this cover. It's known for like the beauty, it's known for like just the overall style. And it's actually one of the very few books that I've bought for myself. In the first book, we follow Fair. She lives with her two sisters and her father. They're all pretty much starving at this point and she decides to go hunting in a kind of an off-limits area of the forest. Well, chance encounter puts her on the wrong side of an ancient fairy treaty and she's taken into custody. At first, she cannot think of anything but escape, but the longer she spends in the fairy realm, the more she feels kind of swept up by it, by its magic, its mayhem. Even her captor, Tamlin, ends up not being nearly as bad as she thought he was, and that he and the rest of his people are under a masquerade curse where they have to wear masks for the last 50 years, and accompanying that curse is a blight that is spreading across the realm. She is given one hope. If she can figure out this curse and break it in time, then everyone would be saved from the evil Queen Amarantha's reign. But the limit for the curse breaking is coming up soon. So I originally picked up this series because I had a friend who loved it, and she wanted me to love it too. And after some hemming, some hawing, I picked up the book. And I hated it. <laughs> From page 1 to nearly 200, it was just like every YA book out there mashed together. Every time I was about to like officially give up on it, there'd always be like this like one or two details that would keep me going. Whether it be like some sort of minor detail of the creepy fairy creatures, or it be like the mysterious Resand, who is Amarantha's right hand man, and obviously evil, but like at the same time I don't understand what he's doing. Thank goodness for that. Because almost exactly at that halfway mark, things turned around magnificently. And I never would have seen it coming. All of the really dumb plot holes and the character decisions and everything that was really annoying me became like hugely relevant to the plot. And I was just, oh. it takes a lot to surprise me this much in a book. And it was achieved. And it ended on a really high, really great cliffhanger for me and I was just ready for the second book immediately. Speaking of the second book, let's move on to it. Akomaf, aka A Court of Mist and Fury, takes place about a few months after the events of the first book. Pharaoh manages to end Queen Amarantha's reign and break the curse. And in exchange for what she did, the seven high lords of the Fae Kingdoms each gave her a part of their magic. Now this includes Tamlin of the Spring Court, and Resand of the Night Court. And from the surface, it appears that she has gotten her happy ending. Defeated the big bad, got engaged to the super hot guy, everything looks like it should work out. Except things turn dark for Farah. She managed to save the entire world, but the thing she did to get there starts to haunt and twist her a bit. And right on Farah's wedding day with Tamlin, who shows up but Rysand? to whisk her away in his dark clutches. But soon, Farah realizes that there's actually quite a bit more at stake than just one ruined wedding. The King of Hybern is trying to break through the wall. The wall is the only barrier separating the human and the fey realms. Farah must work with her sisters to try and corral this and prevent this war from happening. Holy shit. <laughs> like seriously, I cannot remember the last time where I was 50-50 on the first book to 110% on the second. The character development, the plot development, just the world building in general blew my mind. What really brought me into this series is the little things. Like Sarah J Maas has this way of just creating an amazing characters out of just a few short lines. Take the serial for example. Now that 
character was only present in like uh, 10 pages of the book like very very little but at the same time like hands down that is one of my favorite characters of the entire series i also loved the love in this one like from book one like there are maybe a few hints but it definitely didn't tell me where that love interest was fully going i was taken by such surprise in this book that at the same time i'm there for it i loved the way i was surprised so let's go on to the third one we have echo war <laughs> aka a court of wings of ruin farah is now ruling the night court with rysand and the war is upon them king hybern is just around the corner He's rallying his troops. The only chance to save her people is to unite the seven fey kingdoms and the queens of the human realm as well. However, the queens have other plans. This book, I would say it tied on the level of stunning as the second book. The way Sarah J Maas just juggles so many characters in a single book blows my mind. Really loved getting to see Farrah's sisters a bit more. Nesta and Elaine are both like so different, but yet they work so well and they balance each other perfectly. The little things from book one and two become really big in book three. And that's just such a cool thing to watch. And it makes me want to reread this series and see what else I might have missed. The next one in this series is A Court of Frost and Starlight. This is bridging the gap between the last book of the main trilogy and the start of the new trilogy, which is going to follow more minor characters from the first round. Aquafast is definitely a lot more lighthearted than the previous, and you just get to see the characters having fun in the snow, celebrating winter solstice, buying gifts for each other, so it's a lot sweeter and lighthearted than the previous books. But at the same time, I was okay with that. Like, it's kind of nice just to watch the characters interact, have some fun, not worry about them dying constantly. And by Sergei Mass's standards, this is a pretty short book. It's less than 300 pages, so it's also a pretty quick read. I mean, it does manage to tease things that are happening in the fourth book. And speaking of the fourth book, it is an overall continuation of the series, but it's also focusing on a different set of main characters. So instead of following Farah and Rysand again, now we're following Nesta, Farah's sister, and Cassin, who is one of the right-hand men of Rysand's court. And it's called A Court of Silver Flames, aka Akos. Now I'm just going to unpack a few things here. I fully acknowledge that in the grand scheme of things, this is not the most important aspect of the universe. But at the same time, I do feel rather annoyed. They've had a very distinctive cover style, one that really convinced me to buy this series, honestly. However, there's recently been a second set of covers released, and I'll just pop those up here. I'm not against new covers for a series. I kind of love it when a favorite of mine gets a little facelift and a new dust jacket, and I quite frequently have multiple copies of Little Women and of Green Gables, Little House in the Prairie, like my absolute favorites. And Harry Potter. I feel like Harry Potter is probably one of the most famous series for doing this. And I feel like this works really well because there is something so iconic about the original series. But there's also something inherently fun about buying a new version, whether it be sprayed edges, illustrated, or the new illustrated version. There's just something fun about picking up a brand new matched set. And that is what I feel like I'm most annoyed about, the matching aspect. I have the first four books of the original series because I bought them as they were coming out. Now the fourth book of this series isn't going to match those. And if you wanted to buy that original series, they're not selling it anymore. I'm left with a few options. One, I just accept that my series is going to be unmatching and buy the new books. Two, I just don't buy the new books even though I love this series and I go with like a digital or a library copy. Or three, I have to rebuy the entire set or dust jackets so that everything will match. Unless there is a fourth option, and that is Etsy. The same friend who originally pushed me into reading this series was equally, if not way more annoyed than me about the change in cover style. She scoured the internet. I scoured the internet. And then we found 
the Etsy account that would save us all. This is done by Stars That Dream aka Alexandra and she made a fan version of the cover art in the same style as the original books. The artist was so kind and actually sent me this cover just so I could try it out and let you guys know what I think about it and no kickbacks all I was given was a cover to look at in person. I love it. It is gorgeous. And I don't know how she did this because she was designing this cover way before the fourth book came out. But looking at this book, you're like, oh, well, that's Nesta. Because you can look at it and you say, like, okay, first of all, she doesn't have the hand tattoos that Farrah has. In addition, the way she's posed kind of gives off that stubborn, standoffish feel. She's holding a dagger, which actually plays a pretty big role in the book. And she's wearing this kind of like armor-like outfit, which also fits with what her activities are. And honestly, like, if I hadn't known that this was made by a fan, I would think that this would be the next book in the series. Like, it just, it fits really well with the rest of the books on a whole. That primal urge I have to have my series matching has been satisfied 110%. Let's move on to the review. Fair warning, though, like, if you haven't read the original trilogy plus the side stories, there might be some slight spoilers or head. Now, Akosif, <laughs> as I said before, is Nesta's story. Nesta survived the battle, but the mental scarring from it is affecting her way more than she ever could have anticipated. She's constantly pushing people away, turning to drink, turning to strange men, and eventually it boils over to a point where Farrah says, you have to fix yourself, and since I can't do it for you, here's what you're going to do. And she locks her in a tower. Kind of. Nesta is in that tower, but it's not like just a tower Rapunzel style. Now Nesta has to train with Cassian, Rhysand's right hand man during the day, and then she has to work in the library at night with a lot of other women who were traumatized or brutalized and they kind of go to the library as a refuge. And at first Nesta doesn't want to cooperate at all and she is showing her stubborn Nesta-ness, which is something that I love about her. But eventually she realizes that there is a threat on the horizon far greater than her own personal problems. So mixy thoughts on this one. I feel like my rating on a whole is all over the place. So I'm going to kind of compartmentalize this book. Now I'm not sure if it's because I finished my reread of the original trilogy over the summer, but it felt like the characters this around the book didn't quite match the characters that I knew from the first three. And I feel like some of that could be just because we're seeing Nesta's perspective because obviously, like, Nessa's going to interpret Resand and her sisters differently from the way Fira interprets them. But at the same time, they some of the characters were saying some really questionable things towards Nessa, especially they being aware of her trauma. And that kind of threw me a little bit for the book. So moving on to Nesta in particular, her main trait is stubbornness. And while I loved watching that stiff spine and backbone, from Farrah's perspective, I did not enjoy it as much as I thought when I was reading it from Nesta. So it's just like a lot of pages watching the same response from Nesta, and I wish there was a little bit more variety there. And speaking of the same response, let's talk sex. Sarah J Maas is mostly known because she writes young adult fiction, aka YA. And when you're writing YA, you have limitations for what you can and can show. Long story short, there was a lot of sex in this book. The bedrooms, the bathrooms, the table. Literally, if there was a surface in this story, there was a sex scene on it. I kind of feel like it's when a Disney star gets out of contract and then they can do whatever they want with their lives for the first time in like a decade and they just go crazy. It gets to the point about halfway through the book where you're like, okay, I get it, this is your thing, but do you have to constantly remind me that it is your thing? And I will admit, a well-placed sex scene in a book definitely can enhance the story overall. Like in Aquamath, if you've read the book, you know which one I'm talking about. That one was seared into my memory, but it was also one of my favorite relationship development moments. It kind of comes down to personal taste, where you either like or you don't really like a lot of sex scenes in your book, and personally, I found it distracting. I feel like if you were to cut out like 90% of the sex scenes or even just make them into fade to black, the plot would read a lot smoother and you'd probably save about 100 pages of this book. So if I was to rate this series 
I would go Akotar, four stars, because you can't forget how that beginning was a bit of a downer for me. Akko Math, five stars. Akko War, five stars. And Akko Fast, four stars, because I did enjoy the companion novel, but it was kind of missing some of the overarching plots and excitement from a plot-driven book. And for Akko Sif, I would say three stars. I would say four stars for the plot. It was really slow in the beginning and middle, but it picked up really well towards the end. And then the actual end of the book was so great that I really want the next book in the series. Character changes and the sex was kind of more of a two star moment because it just felt too frequent, too random and too distracting from the plot. Thank you so, so much for watching and happy reading. Bye.